Hello learners, welcome back to the course in labor welfare and industrial relations. So over the past 12 modules, at least some of the lectures you would have covered by now, you would have seen that we have traveled across labor welfare and industrial relations. Today, my attempt is to give you a bird's eye view, a particular bird's eye view whereby I try to synthesize what all learnings we had in different modules. It would act essentially as a recap of what we have learned in, in each and every lecture. But typically, I would like to synthesize, I would like to give some tips how you go about learning a subject like labor welfare and industrial relations. I'm Dr. Abraham Sirlisek. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. So when you look into such a subject, we have to understand it from the basic logic, why we needed such a discipline in the first place. In one of the YouTube live sessions also, I have actually uh, communicated to you, we have to understand the approach, we have to understand the scope. And this is what the initial few modules were all about, to establish what was the need for such a course or such, uh, such a discipline to be developed or evolved. When you look into uh, the way industrial revolution has come up and we had certain delay, undoubtedly we had certain delay in India specifically. When a large accumulation of capital happened in one site, which we essentially call as employer. And when we have a large accumulation of the workforce, which we are calling them as employees, there happened to be a certain equation that evolved out of this. Now, the process of, you know, uh, the process of moving together in case of the labor welfare did not uh, end there. There were many other stakeholders, like employers wanted to have a recognition among themselves. They tried to bring in employer organizations. Employees had or they needed somebody to represent them, to talk for them on behalf of them, so immersed the, the trade unions, what we understand uh, as trade unions or employee organizations. So then the equations of employer organizations, employee organizations, essentially trade unions also came into picture. There were other certain entities like the government of the day, which actually had significant influence on the relationship between you know, employer and employee. So all this has emerged as part of you know, the worker employer relationship. So this is what we have to understand and acknowledge when we delve into such a subject of labor welfare and industrial relations. I would also like to you know, advise you, you go for the different approaches. What were the different approaches actually that were uh, fundamental in actually defining labor welfare and industrial relations. So we'll have a quick bird's eye view. We'll, we'll go it in a detailed way. Uh, I will try to emphasize on significant factors which otherwise were left behind in, in some of the modules. I'll try to cover it in a more comprehensive manner. Let's understand the course in general. When you look into the different uh, weeks, uh, particularly different module, We'll see that you know each module was classified like this. There was uh, you know a set of twelve modules. From module one, we we introduce you to industrial relations. We uh, you know uh, had a detailed analysis of trade unions in in module two specifically, and then we looked into industrial disputes in module three. We'll go into detail. That's why I'm rushing through this particular slide. When you looked into uh, you know module four to seven, I would essentially say this is the bag bone of the entire course structure. You looked into different acts, different laws that have, you know, uh, looked into different aspects, including working conditions, including welfare, including wages, etc. So labor, uh, uh, you know, the module four or week four to week seven essentially dealt into uh, labor welfare part one, part two, part three, part four specifically. Then we had module eight in week eight that looked into child labor prohibition and regulation act specifically. Then we had module nine which looked into the factories act 1948 and module 10 which underscored the payment of wages act 1936 and finally module 11 was all about workers participation so here i would i would like to take a couple of seconds and you know bring out a different notion altogether which i'll i'll again describe in detail but when you come to module 11 and specifically module 12 i wanted you to delve into something which is happening right now what is the work structure right now or how 
you know, the work practices have evolved over the years and what is there happening, you know, what, what is the way of labor welfare and industrial relations in the present day scenario. So this is something which was more uh, concerned to me when it came to module 12. And there cannot be a significant outcome without actually looking into a decision making process where the employee is included. So this was the basic logic why module 11 came into uh, place in the first place. So when you are looking into workers participation, is the worker getting the right to make a decision or he's, he or she made a part of the decision that was the logic behind module 11. So module 11 and module 12 were significant in that respect. Now let's look into each module in greater detail. When you look into module 1 specifically, as I already mentioned, it was all about introduction to industrial relations specifically. So when you are looking into introduction, I try to define industrial relations. You know, uh, if you recollect the labor dictionary definitions which define industrial relations as the relation between you know, employers and employees in industry, or it could be the daily orders industrial relations definition which describes relationships between management and employees or among employees and their organizations that actually characterize or grow out of employment. So all these definitions were significant and if you recollect, even I had introduced you to the definition by John Dunlop who defines you know, the industrial societies necessarily create industrial relations and which is the in turn defined as the complex of interrelations among managers, workers and even agencies of government. So he was one of the uh, pioneering person who actually brought into the agencies of government into picture in the first place. So today, when you look into this term, it stands for oh, such a wide variety of practices, such a wide variety of institutions and has been used in such divergent context, basically where you are actually looking into such complicated tasks. Now, when you are looking into industrial relations specifically, what we understand in industrial relations is whereby you are having different elements. You have the employer-employee relations. You have later on the workers organizing themselves into trade unions and starting dealing with the employers. Then still later, when relations between employers and employees came to be vested with certain public importance and ceased to be private, the state had to be involved in such relations. Even the term industry, if you look into the term industry, that also emerged as part of this relations and industry. The term industry is no longer confined to a small segment of economic activity, but it has come to include all the gainful and employments. It could include service under the state, it could include even service under the private sector also. So the relationship between the state and its employees has also come to acquire many of these characteristics and features of employer-employee relationship in industry. Therefore, if you look into the employer-employee's relationship under public services, it has also come on a greater uh, way when you are looking into industrial relations from the 2024 angle. When you look into industrial relations, you see that there are certain dominant aspects. We have covered it. If you recollect, you, you know, time and again, I try to emphasize on one single aspect. Cooperation was supposedly the norm, but in fact, what we got was conflict. So there has been always a, a tussle between cooperation and conflict. What would be the norm of the, the industrial society? When you're looking into modern industrial production, it's based upon cooperation between labor and capital. There is no doubt about it. But where labor, you know, actually stands for workers who, who man the factories, man the mines and other industrial establishments or services, capital stood for the owners of business enterprises who actually supply the capital and own the final product. So the cooperation between the two is one of the basic requirements for smooth functioning of this modern industry. There is no doubt about it. But unfortunately, when you look into the cooperation, the cooperation is of a minimal degree and is nothing more than mere coming together of, you know, the labor and capital, or if I can use better words, union and the management and is devoid, please note, of any voluntary choice of and regard for the other as a partner. So this is what makes the whole assumption of cooperation become nullified. 
So it flows from the necessity that some sort of working relationship has to be raised in order that the factory operation specifically on which both are dependent may continue. But when you look into conflict, it is essentially the second aspect of the system of industrial relations obtaining today is particularly what we see not the cooperation but the conflict. So conflict is inherent in the industrial relations especially in a setup like what we see today. It becomes apparent when industrial disputes you know results in strikes, it results in lockouts and such activities become very frequent. So prevailing uh, you know industrial unrest, the frequency of you know work stoppages which we see resulting maybe from uh, strikes or lockouts and even to a certain extent slowing down uh, of production are actually the occasional expressions of ever present conflict between you know the workers and specifically the employers. So what we understand here is specifically when you look into the, the background of IR in the post independence period functions of IR specifically, we are trying to define what industrial relations is and moreover we are trying to understand what are the dominant aspects of evolution in industrial relations. When you look into the second most important aspect and I try to highlight this every now and then approaches towards IR and the different models of IR. We have seen that there are different possibilities that IR can have with respect to the approaches and models. You know the foregoing discussions with respect to all the complexity of relationship among workers if their unions, their, their employers, the work organizations, government agencies, all stakeholders. So it has to be emphasized that you know there has to be conflict and how conflict has to be mitigated. So all these aspects have to be seen from different approaches and by approaches I mean uh, by a set of parameters that could be economic, that could be sociological, that could be political, psychological and even cultural factors operating in different countries at different intervals of time. So all these aspects have been viewed with different angles which have led to the emergence of certain approaches to industrial relations. When you look into the economic approach specifically, the industrial relations devolve basically around economic issues. There is no denying the fact. From the very inception of let's say trade unionism, the workers and their organizations have been concerned primarily with the protection and promotion of their members economic interest in the form of you know it could be higher wages, it could be higher monetary gains. So all these involve a certain cost, a certain cost and this is significant and we cannot undermine this. Cost to the employer whose main aim has been to maximize profit and reduce cost. So here comes the first bone of contention, this element of conflicting interest. So if it is not resolved in amicable fashion, it critically gives rise to industrial disputes, you know, problems like lockouts, strikes or other forms of industrial unrest can happen. So this approach specifically uh, to industrial relations has found expression even in the writings of most of the pioneers of trade unionism. Even you look into Sidney and Beatrice Webb which we have already discussed in, in module 1, um, maybe Cummins and even Karl Marx. You know, Karl Marx has gone to the extent of advocating replacement of capitalism by communism dominated by uh, the proletariat under which each would work according to his ability and get according to his needs. So I'll discuss more in the radical approach but this is what Karl Marx is all about. A few others like let's say the guild socialists or what we call them as the syndicalists have in their own way suggest a replacement of capitalism by some other arrangements in order to provide a panacea to the ills of all the free economy. So this is what the economic approach is all about. When you look into sociological approach, it considers industrial relations as a product of the industrial society which is itself a part of the broad social milieu. So the various components of the society, it could be social institutions, social associations, values and standards, customs and traditions, beliefs, all have their impact on the state of industrial relations. So these sociological factors, they play a very significant role in conditioning the behavior pattern of parties to industrial relations and their mutual associations. So in case the points of view, the parties to sociological factors could be harmony 
the industrial relations could be smooth if there is this harmony among these elements. So, if these uh, you know expectations of the people associated with all the movements, if that is not materialized, the workers and their unions may develop an antagonistic attitude against the management which can undoubtedly result in disturbed industrial relations. So, when you talk about the sociological approach, we are actually looking into delicate equation between the workers and the employer and if the expectations of the employers are not satisfied, there could be unrest. Now comes the psychological approach. When you look into the psychological approach to industrial relations, it devolves mainly around the perception of the parties to the same problem. So, perception is important when we look into the psychological approach. So, these perceptions actually may relate to particular situations, persons or even to a certain extent issues. So, if the perception of the parties to the same subject are similar or easily reconcilable, you know, industrial relations tend to be rather be smooth. So, if they are opposed or are in contradiction, situations of conflict can arise. So, the perception of workers may be influenced by several factors such as, you know, it could be their amount of wages they get, the monetary gains they have, the education level, the extent of, you know, the job security they are having, their background, social background typically, the desire for recognition and even enhanced status and nature of supervision. So, if you look into the perception of employers, managers may be influenced by their social status, by the financial condition of the enterprises, governmental policies and even pattern of behavior of union leaders and workers. So, it is not only the employee but also the employer who is also being affected by the so-called perception. That makes the psychological approach all the more relevant, all the more important. When you look into, let us say, the political approach, the political approach to industrial relations may be viewed in two ways. One in wider political perspective and the other in narrower perspective of, let us say, simply like a formation of a government jointly by the employer and the trade union by mutual agreement. So, when you look into the political approach, it is well known that ever since, you know, the advent of modern trade unions, the state has been in the field of industrial relations to regulate the relationship between the parties primarily with a view to safeguard the interest of community or even the entire nation. So, what happens is that many aspects of, you know, these industrial relations, it could be aspects like determination of bargaining agents, it could be, you know, the, the strikes, lockouts, status of collective agreements that have formed or even industrial disputes or unfair labor practices, they have all increasingly been brought under the coverage of law. So, this has in fact, you know, totally resulted in the curtailment of the freedom of both the parties in deciding the issues in a complete free manner. So, they have to operate within the limits set by the government or the governmental agencies. So, besides the political activities of unions and their association with political parties that are also important factors to be reckoned with. So, when you are looking into political approach in a narrower perspective, the power structure of the union management relationship is also an important factor to be considered in industrial relations. I repeat, management equation. So, this along with further collective agreements reached between the employer and the union may be construed as embodiments of, you know, rules governing terms and conditions of employment of workers. Now, we look into the unitary approach and one of the most interesting approach I would say is a unitary approach where the employer and the employee work as a harmonious unit, a very idealistic scenario, but that is the unitary approach ladies and gentlemen for you and they work for a common goal. Hence, there is no possibility of conflicts arising between them and they certainly work as a team to attain the common goal. So, if you look into Edwards 2003, which we have already covered, any conflict that may occur is then seen as a result of misunderstanding or mischief. So, when there is cooperation, set cooperation already established between the, between the employer and the employee and there is a harmonious unit working in, so any conflict is an anomaly.
any conflict is just uh, uh, an outcome or a product of misunderstanding or it could be just mischief. So thus, if you look into conflict, it is perceived as disruptive. The concept of loyalty is privileged in unitarist approach because of its paternalistic roots. So since there is existing direct relationship between employer and employee as we see, trade unions are considered as unnecessary. So when party X and party Y are in good relationship, there is no scope for party C. So this is what makes the, the trade union all the more irrelevant. Then we look into the pluralist approach. The pluralist approach was developed in United States by John Commons. He considered society as a very complex entity due to the presence of you know, all the different multiple interest groups with their own particular goals. So when you look into conflict, conflict is inevitable in the system. And there are possibilities of compromise based on interaction between different stakeholders. So collective bargaining was used as a mechanism to sort out the conflict between the employer and the employees. So the presence of trade union in an organization can serve as an interest group to protect the interest of employees. When you look into Edwards 2003, he defines pluralism as a particularly salient in approach of management instead of unitary denial that there was any rational basis for conflict. Managers should actually recognize the inevitability of dispute and seek means to regulate them. So this is more of a beautiful approach if you ask me. You, know, you cannot be an idealistic person and just believe that there cannot be any, any, any conflict per se. There, there will be conflict. You know, you look into situations where there are employee employers, there, are go there is government, there are employer organizations, there is trade unions, so many stakeholders. Do you think that, you know, conflict cannot happen? No. It is more of an idealistic scenario. So this is where I would like to uh, go with uh, the pluralistic approach that conflict will be there. How to reckon with or how to uh, mitigate that conflict, that would be the key aspect. Now let's look into other approaches. When we look into other approaches other than pluralistic, we see that we have the radical approach, one of the most famous radical approach, especially the radical perspective or the Marxian perspective, what we understand it as is built on the assumption of power conflict between two classes. The classes being capital and labor, as you know. So this results in normative structures and institutionalized forms of, you know, industrial labors per se. So social conflict is very much necessary for social change. It also argues that state does not play a neutral power but helps in consolidation of the power of the employer and their representative. So when you look into the Marxist approach, it is a critic of pluralism. That is something which you have to underline. We define pluralism in a very beautiful way, but when it comes to Marxist approach, it is a critic of pluralism. The economic change that happens due to business cycle forces the government to intervene in the employer-employer relations. Please note, labor is subjugated by the domination of capital and is unable to you know, counter unilateral changes in working conditions and the controls exerted by employers. So the wage specifically to be paid to the employer is the point of conflict between what we see or understand as the employer and the employee. The employer tries to pay as low as possible to increase his profit, whereas the employee tries to obtain wages as high as possible for his or her sustenance. So this has been the fundamental fight that is going on every now and then. Then comes the Mahatma Gandhi's trusteeship approach. I would believe that this is one step ahead of the radical approach and one of the most finest argument towards labor welfare. Gandhi's idea of industrial relations emerged from his, you know, the engagement with the workers throughout his life of particular importance versus engagement specifically uh, with textile workers in Ahmedabad during the strike in a mill in 1918, which we have already discussed. Gandhi led the struggle to obtain a fair increase in wages, while at the same time ensuring that the employers' interests were also taken into account. So Mahatma Gandhiji preferred a harmonious and balanced approach to industrial relations where one side would never dominate the other, but would take into account the other's interest before taking any particular decision. So this 
certainly does not mean that Gandhi's ideas were exactly similar to that of the unitarists, please don't make that mistake, and completely different from Marxist thinking, no. Along with Marx, Gandhi agreed with the ideals of a classless society and a stateless society. Please make a note of it. In Gandhi's view, wealth could never be privately held. Wealth would always be held by people in trust of society. So, trust was the most important word in this situation. So, thus it was necessary for people to actually respond to the needs of society and not the use of wealth or property for individual interests alone. So, this makes the, the trusteeship model or the Gandhian philosophy all the more relevant. Then there are other models like the Dunlop's model of industrial relations system. If you recollect what we have discussed in module 1, John Dunlop developed this system approach, systems thinking approach to industrial relations in the form of a general theory. So, according to him, uh, if you recollect, the central task of industrial relations was to explain why particular rules are established in particular industrial relations systems and how and why they change in response to changes affecting the system. So, Dunlop's focus of attention has been on the formulation of rules governing workplace and the community involved in the work. So, certainly that shows us where do we stand in the second lecture where you looked into the actors of industrial relations and specifically the different models and approaches of industrial relations. Now to the most important part in the first module which was trade unionism. We tried to understand why trade unionism came in first place, what was the need of trade unionism, what or how these trade unionism or trade unions evolved what were their initial thought process and how they evolved, what was the political connection that happened with respect to trade unionism. So, a lot of discussion that have happened in trade unionism and let us recollect them one by one. Introduction to trade union, labor legislation, workers participation was what we saw in the third lecture specifically. So, when you look into trade union, it is nothing but a continuous association of workers, employees for the protection and promotion of the economic, social and other rights and interest of its members. So, when you look into a comparison of, you know, the trade unionism, we will see that there are different unions representing different ideologies. Whatever be the ideology, whatever be the, the way they are being conducted, trade unions serve several functions or they are destined to serve several functions, all aimed at protecting and advancing the rights and interests of workers. So, some of the functions could be, one, the most discussed across the 12 modules, collective bargaining. Collective bargaining was one of the primary functions of the trade unions and it was to negotiate with employers on behalf of their members to secure better wages. It could be with respect to working conditions or benefits and other terms of employment. So, through collective bargaining, Unions aim to achieve agreements that benefit their members collectively. Representation and advocacy was yet another important thing. Trade unions represent workers in various forms including disciplinary hearings, grievances and other workplace disputes. They advocate for the rights of workers, ensuring fair treatment and protection from unjust practices by employers. When you look into other functions, it included worker education and training, the awareness campaigns, you know, to provide training, necessary skills needed to navigate the workplace effectively, understand the rights of the, the labor class in general and, you know, participate in the union activities and to a certain extent, the most important conflict resolution, trade unions categorically played a role in resolving disputes between workers and employers. It could be through negotiation, it could be through mediation, it could be through even arbitration processes. So, they strive to find mutually acceptable solutions to conflicts and maintain harmonious relations. So, when you look into trade union specifically, we had certainly discussed different legislations pertaining to trade unions. I will just touch upon, we had looked into the Trade Union Act, if you remember, 1926. We had looked into the Trade Union Amendment Act of 2011. We had touched upon the, the Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act 1946. 
the Industrial Disputes Act 1947, which governs the resolution of all the industrial disputes and provides mechanism for collective bargaining, layoff procedures and legal recourse in case of conflicts uh, between employers and workers, etc. Then we had certain concentration upon legislations pertaining to wages. It could be the Payment of Wages Act, which we discussed in related to, to timely payment of wages. The Payment of Wages Amendment Act 2005, that was also critically discussed. The Minimum Wages Act 1948, which established a minimum wage standard to safeguard the interest of workers and ensure a decent standard of living regardless of the nature of the employment. The Payment of Bonus Act 1965, which mandated the payment of bonuses to employees in the certain establishments based on profits and productivity. The Equal Remuneration Act 1976, which categorically prohibits discrimination in wages based on gender, ensuring that men and women receive equal pay for equal work, thereby promoting gender equality in workplace. There were also discussions on legislation pertaining to work conditions, if you recollect. The Factories Act 1948 was a pioneering act in this space which regulated the working conditions in factory, you know, ensuring the, the safety, the health, the welfare of the workers, and even addressing issues such as working hours, hygiene, and hazardous processes, etc. The Contract Labor Regulation and Abolition Act 1970 was yet another act. We also looked into the Shops and Establishment Act. Shops and Establishment Act is a state-level legislation, please note that governs the establishment, working hours and conditions of employment in shops, commercial establishments and other similar workplaces, actually ensuring you know, proper regulation and welfare of employees. There were also discussions on the Dock Workers Regulation of Employment Act 1948, which governs employment conditions and the welfare measures for dock workers, ensuring the safety and regulating the working hours and wages specifically. We also delved into the Plantation Labor Act 1951, the Mines Act 1952, if you recollect, the Merchant Shipping Act 1958, which governs the various aspects related to merchant shipping in India, including the regulation of employment, conditions for seafarers, safety measures, and environmental protection in the maritime activities. The building and other construction workers that was also part of this set of legislations. Then we looked into the, the welfare part, the legislation pertaining to women and children specifically. The first and the foremost and the most important one, the Maternity Benefit Act 1961, which provided maternity benefits to women employees, including paid maternity leave and medical benefits to ensure their health and well-being during pregnancy and childbirth. There was also discussion on the Child Labor Prohibition and Regulation Act 1986, which prohibits the employment of children in certain occupations and regulates the working conditions of child laborers to protect their rights and ensure their education and development. We also discussed on a certain legislations pertaining to social security, which include but not limited to, let's say, the Workmen's Compensation Act 1923, the Employee State Insurance Act, one of the most important act, the Employee State Insurance Act 1948, which establishes certainly a social security system that provided medical and cash benefits to employees and their dependents in case of sickness, in case of maternity, in case of disablement or death due to employment-related injuries or illnesses. We also looked into the Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act, another Social Net Act, the Payment of Gratuity Act 1972, and even the Unorganized Worker Social Security Act 2008, which aimed to provide social security and welfare measures to unorganized workers, including access to health care, maternity benefits, life and disability coverage, and old age protection, ensuring their economic and social well-being. So that was all about M1 L3. When we look into the lecture four, where, where we try to understand employers' federation, and the role in industrial relations. So we looked into, uh, you know, what is an employer's federation, which is also known as an employer's association or a business federation, which is in turn an organization that represents the collective interest of employers within a particular industry, region or country. So these federations typically consist of individual companies or even certain business entities, which come together to ad advocate for common interests and concerns related to, you know, the labor relations, government policies, and even business regulations. So the specific structure 
and the functions of employers, federations can vary depending on the context, but their overarching goal is to promote the interest of employers and create an environment conducive to business growth, uh, business competitiveness, and even to a certain extent, sustainability. We also discussed about the functions of employer federations. We also looked into the levels of federations. If you recollect, employers organizations are organized at three levels. You know, the employers operating through their local organization is the first level. Regional industrial associations which cut across state boundaries, they are part of the second level. And the federations which have an all India basis, you know, comprising representatives both of industries and centers is the third limit. So these are some of the critical aspects when we understand employers, federation and the role in IR. When we look into the last lecture of module one, we try to understand what are the salient features of industrial relations specifically in India. The development of industrial relations in the country has passed through certain distinct stages prior to the first world war. So the relationship between employers and workers was mainly in the nature of master and servants. I have tried to emphasize this time and again because we were not having the, the required independence to actually perform, work well and have the required or the desired dignity. So during this period what happened is that the British government intervened in the field of industrial relations now, primarily with a view to protect the interest of the British employers. So the main features of industrial relations during the period from the end of the First World War to the independence of the country were many. It could be an exhaustive list, but you know certainly it had provisions of strengthening of the trade union movement and active involvement of eminent nationalists and other leaders in the movement. It had you know elements of enactment of trade union trade unions, you know industrial disputes and standing order laws. It had establishment of permanent tripartite bodies at various levels. You know enabling the parties to participate in the deliberations concerning broader labor and industrial relations issues and you know arrive at a unanimous decision at many points appointment of commissions and committees as at intervals for deliberating on specific areas of labor issues and finally enactment of a series of protective and social security bylaws so when you look into uh, the salient features of industrial relations in india we have to accept and acknowledge that the main features of industrial relations in the country during the post-independence period have been formation and strengthening of both workers and employers organization at various level. General freedom of the parties to resolve the disputes by negotiation and availability of the services of these conciliation officers for helping the parties to arrive at an amicable settlement. Provision of a network of adjudication authorities for deciding industrial disputes with binding awards in the event of the failure of the parties to resolve their disputes. And all the more, if you look into the imposition of all the legal restrictions, the strikes, the lockouts, especially in public utility and essential services. Provision of machineries under the, under the law to prevent industrial disputes from arising. So these were some of the salient features that uh, industrial relations can be uh, traced with, especially in the Indian context. Then we come to the second module, second module where we try to bring in a detailed understanding of trade unionism. We try to understand the birth of trade union, the evolution of trade union, what were the different approaches to a trade union, what were the different ideological bases for trade union, how trade union fared or you know, uh, performed in different situations. So let's look into that in greater detail. When you look into trade union, the, the first lecture of module two specifically was all about the origin. You know, the origin actually uh, underscored the separation between capital and labor. We tried to understand, uh, you know, what was the reason for the separation. You know, nascent trade unions can be traced back to the second half of the 18th century in England. During this period, the economic system of England was undergoing rapid changes and economic order commonly known as capitalism emerged. So new industries based on iron, coal came into existence. They underwent uh, great rapid technological changes and large scale production replaced the small workshops of the past. So when we look into the pre-industrial society, the worker producer owned the tools 
provided their own uh, raw materials, worked in their own home and kept the final product mostly for their own consumption and occasionally for the sale in market. So basically when you look into uh, the birth of trade union, we have to understand the different uh, ideologies or I would call them the philosophy, the philosophy of laissez-faire, the dominant philosophy of laissez-faire which is also known as the economic liberalism prevented the state from coming to the rescue of the suffering industrial workers. So in the eyes of law, the workers and the employers were equal and had equal claims to legal protection. The relationship was supposedly based upon contracts freely and voluntarily entered into. The disgruntled, dissatisfied and oppressed workers were allegedly free persons, you know, free to choose their employers, occupations and place of work and free not to work under the terms and conditions they did not like. Then there was lack of bargaining power on the part of workers. That was yet another important feature. Individual dispensability but collective indispensability. So there remained one ray of light and hope for the working class. The individual workman was dispensable to the employer but workmen collectively were indispensable. So when you are looking into workman Workman was dispensable to the employer, but workmen, workmen collectively were indispensable. So this has been the basic philosophy, the basic logic of trade unionism. The employer could easily get rid of the services of few workmen, but could not dispense with the services of all workmen and readily replace them. So this realization of their collective indispensability was a watershed in the history of the working class. So in it lay the roots of collective bargaining that later resulted in what is known as the trade unions. So please note the emergence, the, the philosophy of emergence of trade unions. So this realization of the collective indispensability was something which was vital for the working class. So when you look into trade unionism, the, the first lecture in second module typically talks about the concept, the evolution, different aspects of labor welfare, etc. When you come to the second lecture, objectives of trade unionism were discussed. We looked into the methods, the basis of trade unions, etc. You, if you recollect, you'll see that the generic goal of protecting and promoting workers' interests consists of some specific objectives. It could include improvement of economic status of workers, shorter working day, improvement of working and living conditions, income security, better health, safety and welfare standards, respect and humane treatment from colleagues and supervisors, greater voice in industrial administration and management, and even improvement of political status. So if you look into the basis of organization, these were some of the critical aspects. You know, when you look at any factory, any industrial center, we can have a clarification of these concepts. Let's take the labor force of a cotton textile mill, for example, consists of weavers, consists of spinners, doffers, and carding men. They include dyers, maybe bleachers, or even printers, etc. So all these entities certainly exist. So the maintenance section of the same mill may employ fitters, may employ mechanics, may employ electricians, carpenters, and so on. So these different categories of workers may be set to belong to different crafts. The levels of skill, training, apprenticeship, as well as earnings are different. So hence, if you recollect, each craft has an identity of its own and the interest and needs of workers engaged in it may differ from those of the other workers. If in a cotton textile mill like center, like let's say Mumbai or Ahmedabad, the weavers employed in different mills decide to come together to form a trade union, such a trade union is called craft union. I think uh, this was not discussed previously, so make a note of it, how trade unions can also come together and be called craft union. Then we look into the third lecture. In the particular lecture, we looked into the trade union federation. We looked into the presence of local trade unions, reasons for growth, compulsory unionism, etc. When you look into federation, trade union federations, also known as labor federation or central labor organizations are powerful players in the world of work. They actually function as an umbrella organization uniting individual uh, trade unions within a specific industry, within a specific region or ideology to that extent. 
this this certainly has certain ramifications with respect to the trade union when you look into the role of trade union federations again the first and the foremost one would be the collective bargaining strength federations can negotiate on behalf of a larger group of workers potentially securing more favorable terms and conditions of employment in industry and individual unions might have less leverage lobbying and advocacy is also a part of it solidarity through coordination when you look into federations that facilitate communication and collaboration among affiliated unions fostering solidarity and unified action during strikes or protests is also vital there could be also empowering through knowledge they often provide research and educational resources to member unions empowering them to better represent their members needs and global cooperation federations can actually connect with their international labor organizations and collaborate on global issues impacting workers right when you look into typically the the types of trade union federations you had the trade union happening at global federation global level global federations had a broader voice which brings in a a broader representation broader focus examples such as you know the trade union confederation international trade union confederation ituc or the industry all global union and you look into other national federation it is a unified force within borders there is again a certain representation on a national level the focus is also national some of the examples could be you know the american federation of labor and congress of industrial organization afl cio in the united states the trade union congress tuc in the united kingdom so these are some of the national federations when you look into the sectoral federations the representation is typically sectoral sectoral federations bring together trade unions operating within a specific industry and the examples could be something like if i recollect international trade transport workers federation itf for transportation workers and education international for education professionals ei so these are some of the critical uh, you know uh, types of trade unionism at different levels in the particular lecture we also discussed about the importance of trade unions local trade unions what is the significance of the local trade unions this was also something which was very vital uh, when you look into local tra trade unions unlike the the national international ones you have the direct access and support you have a opportunity for building relationships you know local unions foster a sense of community and solidarity among members within a specific workplace or industry so this can empower them to collectively address issues and advocate for their rights you know you have understanding of local nuances building bargaining power is critical influencing national agenda is also a possibility we also looked into compulsory unionism please recollect what is compulsory unionism compulsory unionism also known as a closed shop has emerged as a contentious topic within the india's labor landscape to tell the least so this system actually mandates the workers in a designated workplace or industry become members of a specific trade union as a condition of employment while some view it as a mechanism to strengthen worker rights others raise concerns regarding the impact on individual freedoms and employer autonomy so there are uh, some positive aspects of compulsory unionism but there are certain challenges of compulsory unionism also if you recollect we have discussed about the restrictions on freedom of association we have discussed on the potential for abuse of power the limited worker choice you know this this particular system inherently restricts worker choice when it comes to union representation so the workers may have preference for joining a different union or opting out of union membership altogether there's a possibility of reduced employer flexibility when you look into the unionism we have benefits of compulsory unionism not only the challenges but also the benefits like enhanced bargaining power standardized representation financial stability for unions reduced free rider problem where worker actually enjoys the benefits of union representation without contributing financially it can be minimized under compulsory unionism many people actually you know are are social loafers within the trade unionism and that could be easily restricted 
When you look into the fourth lecture, the second module, we, look, we discussed about the Trade Union Act, specifically the aim, scope, registration, rights and the responsibilities of trade unions specifically. We looked into the historical background to start with. The rise of industrialization was one of the, the foremost agenda. We looked into the labor unrest. The period witnessed, you know, growing labor unrest. We discussed about that, you know, with great strikes and protests becoming more frequent, workers demanding better working conditions, fair wages, and a voice in the workplace decision. We also looked into the need for regulation. Need for regulation, the government recognized the need to regulate the activities of, uh, you know, some of the unions. We also discussed about the objectives of the trade union, the Trade Union Act specifically, 1926. Now, providing a legal framework, protecting workers' right, regulating the union activities to a certain extent, and promoting industrial peace were some of the most critical objectives of the Trade Union Act 1926. Now, we also, in lecture 4, we also understood what are trade unions? Are they mere workers' association? Or what do they provide? Do they provide something like a collective voice? So, these were also discussed, if you recollect. I'm not going into that in detail, but let me underscore the functions and purpose of trade union. Again, the function remained the collective bargaining being the most important aspect. Grievance redressal was also very critical. Protection from unfair practices for vital. Promoting worker rights was critical and lobbying and advocacy was also one of the most fundamental uh, function and purpose of trade union. When you look into the scope of Trade Union Act 1926, the applicability was mainly nationwide coverage. Worker and employer associations were part of it. It had a broad scope. If you go through the act, you will understand it. Uh, it. It included manufacturing, it included services, it included agriculture, it included public sector undertakings, etc. Some of the exclusions were, you know, unregistered unions were there, armed forces typically were excluded from the ambit of the act. Police personnel, they are also generally not covered under the act's provision regarding forming trade unions. So these were some of the critical aspects which we discussed in lecture 4. We also looked into the registration process uh, within this lecture where you tend to understand or you where we try to understand the requirements for registration, like the minimum membership, name and address, membership rules, and office bearers, details, etc. The registration pro procedure in general, application form, required documents, scrutiny by registrar, potential inquiries, registration certificate, etc. We looked into the additional points, you know, the time frame, appeal process, and we also understood the impact, not only with respect to the national impact, the globalization impact, what were, were the different challenges that were that trade unions are facing even now, the legal complexities, you know, the multiplicity of unions, the outdated laws, the declining of union membership, you know, the member engagement becomes very less, changing workforce demographics, additional challenges, you know, limited reach in informal sector, technological advancements. We also looked into what is the future for these trade unions, if you recollect. And finally, in the last lecture of the module two, we looked into the size and finance of trade union, trade union rivalry and recognition particularly. We looked into the membership statistics. What, were, what was the difficulty or what were the challenges with respect to the data? We looked into some of the latest official data. So if you recollect what uh, we had discussed during that time, according to the Labor Bureau's report on trade unions in India in 2020, Registered trade unions were 19,875. So out of which only a fraction, I think around 14% submitted returns. So basically you have a total membership of around 1 crore, 3 lakh, 77,000 um, around people who are part of these registered trade unions. Then there are possibilities or problems which we discussed with respect to sector-wise distribution, limited data availability due to sector-wise distribution, be it manufacturing, public sector, formal service sector or the informal sector. We also discussed about the financial structure of trade unions. We looked into the, the source of funding. Uh, mainly it came from the membership subscriptions. Mainly it came from the donations. Mainly it came from the government grants, even budget allocation, etc. We also looked into the trade union 
rivalry which was one of the most interesting discussions uh, during our lecture in module 2 we looked into you know factors that contributed to this rivalry multiple you know central trade union organizations typical ideological differences they had ego clashes and leadership struggles they had employer strategies and we also looked into the rivalry scenario like uh, you know inter-union violence was uh, prominent we had certain issues of disagreements over strike actions or you know competing unions in a single industry etc we also understood the impact on labor movements impact of this trade union rivalry on labor movements because these were the organizations that were specifically designed to work for a collective goal and when they when they drift away from that particular goal the the consequences are detrimental so we also understood the legal framework the process of recognition of different trade unions and we also tried to look into the typical challenges that these trade unions face in a day-to-day -day aspect and finally, we also looked into the future of trade unions, if you remember. We looked into how the trade unions have to adapt to the, to the changing workforce. You know, the gig economy challenge was one of the most uh, uh, severe one. The rise of gig economy, non-traditional work arrangements presents a significant challenge for unions, which were built around the model for traditional full-time employee. New organizing strategies were required. Focus on skills and training, or, you know, organizing across sector. You know, digital communication, data-driven strategies, organizing tools. Focus on universal basic rights, etc or even regulation of the gig economy was also also one of the most critical aspect in you know, looking forward for the trade union within the within the uh, you know changing workforce so these were some of the aspects which we discussed in module 2 in module 3 we looked into industrial disputes now from here on we try to understand what were the different aspects that came in you know because of the increasing number of stakeholders dispute was a consequence of the conflict which was there cooperation again was a norm but what we found out was conflict so what are the different aspects with respect to industrial disputes so let's look into that in greater detail in module 3 what we understood with respect to industrial disputes we started our session with the first lecture where we try to include the industrial disputes meaning the causes interests and the right disputes so basically we looked into if you remember uh, the case what we started with in case of the workmen of Dimakuchi T estate was management of Dimakuchi T estate 1958. Uh, the definition of industrial dispute what was given by Supreme Court, uh, that was the key uh, criteria with which we started the discussion. It had three aspects, factum of the dispute, parties to the dispute, the subject matter of the dispute. The factum is the written argument that you will use to present your appeal. Industrial dispute means the real and substantial difference between the parties having an element of persistence and which can endanger the industrial peace of community if not resolved timely. So it means the dispute must be definite and related to the terms and conditions of the employment or non-employment of the person. When you look into the parties to the dispute, uh, uh, section 2k of the act uh, actually gives a couple of points one is employers and employees uh, employers and workmen or workmen and workmen so when you look into dispute uh, we we try to emphatically cover most of the scenarios of industrial disputes if you recollect the types of industrial disputes and to a certain extent the causes of industrial disputes also when you look into the the industrial dispute types the industrial dispute being one type, grievance disputes or the rights dispute being another type, unfair labor practice disputes being another type, recognition disputes being another type. I am not going to waste time here because we have discussed in detail but it, just as a recap I thought of telling this. When you look into the causes, we looked into the economic causes, demand for higher wages and elements was one of the aspect, demand for bonus was another important aspect, issues related to working hours. If you recollect, many times industrial dispute occur due to conflict in fixing reasonable working hours for the workmen. So when workers do not agree to the management standards of working hours, a dispute arises between them. 
workmen do expect not only fair wages or reasonable working hours but also safe working conditions with required equipment installed or safety measures taken to provide enabling conditions for the workmen so it is also includes you know providing various other facilities like canteen you know clean toilets clean drinking water proper lighting etc uh, there could be also issues related to modernization of machineries modernization of machinery means industrial dispute can arise due to uh, you know introduction of automated machineries in industries which actually leads to if you think through uh, leads to the replacement of manual labor in the industry workers often go on strikes or go slow in order to show their resistance to the management which ultimately results in industrial disputes there are critical aspects of leaves and unpaid leaves sometimes workmen were forced to take leaves due to certain unavoidable circumstances or accidents that occur in their families or surroundings so in this case uh, the management cut their wages for days they were absent from work this causes disputes between the management and the workmen when you look into managerial causes you have non recognition of trade unions many times employers refuse to recognize the trade unions which were representing the workmen in several disputes the management of the industry is usually suspicious about the workers involvement with their trade unions therefore they always try to prevent them from joining any trade union or uniting to form a new trade union employees do not recognize their trade unions for representing them or deliberately recognize the rival union so that their demands cannot be accomplished non enforcement of the agreements before joining work in the industry the workers and employers enter into various agreements to decide on various issues related to work ill treatment of workers could be another aspect corrupt recruitment procedures when you look into the interest of the management in order to accomplish their selfish goals if they employ corrupt practices in recruiting workers in industry sometimes uh, workers are recruited through bribe middlemen sometimes unions oppose ill treatment by employers which leads to conflict between two parties there are situations of correct procedures you know correct incorrect recruitment being followed mainly with respect to the process the due process is not followed sometimes the issues pertain to victimization or a wrongful termination of workers many employers follow you know the policy of hire and fire which means there is no security of a job for the worker they are employed for some purpose and after fulfillment of that purpose they are just fired without any reason so workers are terminated or retrenched due to this downfall in the industry so workers who actively participate in the affairs of trade unions also face dismal or termination before in preference so when you look into other issues there are political causes political influences government support for management is another issue trade union movements that is again another issue internal conflicts between trade unions so these are some of the problems which we discussed in first lecture when we looked into the second lecture especially with respect to strikes forms and effects of strikes we looked into what are the different types of strikes if you recollect based on the phenomena of strikes around the world we categorized strikes into economic strikes we categorized strikes into sympathy strikes general strikes sit down strikes slow down strikes hunger strikes and even wild cat strikes that have been experienced over the period we also looked into certainly economic strike you know some some of the most uh, pertinent strikes that emerged out of these these particular strikes were economic we also uh, i'm not going into the detail of every single strike but we tried to uh, understand what was the logic behind e strike and how it manifested in itself we also looked into some of the common reasons for strike and we also ended uh, the the lecture with the concept of illegal strikes and penalties if you recollect in india strikes became illegal not because of the objects but because of the breach of the statutory provisions so when you look into strikes in contravention of the provisions of the industrial dispute act of 1947 the central civil services conduct rules of 1964 the central service maintenance act as ma of 1981 are illegal the circumstances under which strike shall be legal and under which they shall be deemed to be legal are provided in section 24 of the act 
Now, when it comes to uh, the, the third lecture in the module, we looked into the Industrial Disputes Act 1947. We looked into specifically the dispute settlement machineries. So, in this particular act, we, we dealt into detail amendment of the act that happened in 2010. We looked into the different possibilities that the amendment brought in. We try to underscore the machinery based on our understanding of the amendment. So, Industrial Disputes Act 1947, uh, to be precise, provides an elaborate and efficient machinery for peaceful and amicable settlement of the industrial disputes. We had the introduction of work committees, conciliation officers, if you recollect, board of conciliation, courts of inquiry, labor courts, tribunals, etc. So, all these aspects were generally discussed with respect to the machinery for settlement of industrial disputes. Again, in the fourth lecture, we looked into the statutory and non-statutory measures of settlement. Statutory measures relate to various types of machinery set up by government under the Industrial Disputes Act. It can be conciliation and mediation, voluntary arbitration and adjudication. We have the non-statutory measures. Uh, code of discipline, workers participation management and collective bargaining are supported by government and help in settlement of disputes. Now, these are some of the critical aspects when you look into the statutory and non-statutory measures of uh, settlement. I repeat, statutory measures include conciliation and mediation. One of the most familiar ways to carry out the settlement of disputes under the Industrial Dispute Act 1947 is conciliation, which is also known by the name of mediation. So, it is not only restricted in to India, but this method of dispute settlement is used all across the globe. Conciliation is a procedure in which there is an involvement of a third party who provides assistance to parties in dispute to carry out the negotiation between them. Voluntary arbitration is there. So, before dealing with the concept of voluntary arbitration as a whole, it is preferred to refer them separately for a better understanding. So, arbitration means a procedure which involves a third party in the form of a single arbitrator or a board of arbitrators who are assigned with the duty to resolve the dispute between the parties. Voluntary symbolizes self-willingness and consent. Please note that. Then there is adjudication. In adjudication, it is not that adjudication replaces conciliation totally, but rather the matter is if, if conciliation fails to settle the dispute between the parties and the industry, adjudication takes charge in carrying out the job which the conciliation mechanism was actually assigned to do. So, just another legal remedy that can be adopted if necessity arises. So, the ultimate remedy for resolving an industrial dispute is essentially by adjudication and please note, especially in our country, there is a three-tier system. Labor court is there. Industrial tribunal is there and national tribunal is there. So, these are some of the statutory aspects when you look into non-statutory which is I would feel it is, it is more interesting. Non-statutory would include a code of discipline. A code of discipline in industrial relations is a set of guidelines or rules agreed upon by the employers, workers and their representatives to maintain harmonious relations and ensure a peaceful work environment. So, it basically outlines the expected behavior and responsibilities of both employers and employees in the workplace and provides a, a typical framework for resolving conflicts and dispute. Then we have the collective bargaining also as one of the most important non-statutory measure. Collective bargaining, we had a specific discussion of that in, in the last lecture of the module 3 where we tried to start with the definition of Sydney and Beatrice Webb again. If you remember, I repeat here, collective bargaining is a process of bargaining between employers and the workers by which they settle the disputes among themselves relating to employment, non-employment, terms of employment, conditions of service of workers on strength of sanctions available to each side. So, we looked into some of the theories and types of collective bargaining if you remember. We looked into the pluralistic theory as the first theory which sees collective bargaining as a process of negotiation and compromise between unions and management. We looked into the unitary theory. Unitary theory, the theory which views the employer and employees not as separate interest groups but as part of the same organizational unit with aligned objectives. We tend to understand the focus which was on cooperation and common interest rather than conflict. Employees are seen as important contributors to organizational success 
and we will then looked into the Marxian theory. The Marxist theory views collective bargaining through a typical class struggle lens. Please note, when it is Marxian theory, it definitely has a class struggle element into that. It has the following, you know, essential aspects like it includes the relationship between employers and employees. Employers is specifically the capitalist class, if I can name them like that. They own the means of production and seek to maximize profits while employees, the working class, sell their labor for a particular way. So their economic interests are certainly opposed. Then you had the legal framework theory, if you remember. The facts about legal framework theory uh, included, you know, seeing or observing collective bargaining as governed and shaped by the legal framework of labor laws and regulations. The laws acts as an external mechanism to resolve conflict, set standards for bargaining and enforce agreements reached. Unions and management bargain within boundaries defined by labor laws. Then there is power resource theory. Power resource theory argues that the power of organized labor, especially in our case the trade unions, it determines the bargaining outcome. So the stronger the unions, the more bargaining power workers have to secure better terms to collective actions like strikes, etc. Then we also looked into the neo-pluralistic theory. The facts about neo-pluralistic theory would include, you know, collective bargaining as involving multiple interest groups within the uh, within and outside the organization. Groups like, you know, unions, management, community groups and shareholders that negotiate to balance the interest of all stakeholders. Then we looked into the types of collective bargaining agreements in India, if you recollect, bipartite agreement. We looked into settlements, we looked into the consent awards. Also, we ended the discussion with hurdles of collective bargaining uh, you know what are the reasons for failure of collective bargaining in India if you understand if you recollect we have seen weak unions as one of the reasons cited for that problems from government being one of the issue legal problems attitude of management many a time happens to be one of the hurdle employers uncertainty about who is recognized or who is the recognized bargaining agent is one of the most important aspect. Statutory fixation of the conditions of the work and to a certain extent political interference was also considered as one of the critical uh, issue when it comes to the act or when it comes to the collective bargaining or successful implementation of collective bargaining. In module 4, we looked into the labor welfare. We started looking into labor welfare. Please note that module 4, 5, 6, 7 typically were the, the critical modules which looked into the entire course and they emerged as the backbone of the course totally. So most of the critical acts, most of the laws, most of the you know typical aspects concerning all the, all the essential uh, welfare measures, uh, all the essential working conditions aspect, all the wages aspect, everything was covered under module 4. Let's look into module 4 in greater detail. When you looked into module 4, when we looked into module 4, we looked into the labor welfare, specifically the part 1, where we tried to understand labor welfare, what do you mean by that, what is labor welfare? You know, on, on the negative side, labor welfare is an activity that is associated with reducing the damaging impacts of the large scale industrial system of production. Notably, if you look into Indian scenario, capitalistic in India, on the workers, personal, family and social life. On the positive side, it deals with offering opportunities for the workers and his family to enjoy a good life in the widest sense conceivable. So this personal objective is inadequate on its own. So what we understand, how it can be achieved, this was what was discussed in the first lecture. The need for labor welfare, the objectives of labor welfare, particularly from various studies, we try to summarize if you recollect the objectives of uh, the labor welfare. One being it provides social comfort to employees. Two, support overall improvement of employees. Three, provide financial support indirectly to the employees. Four, contribute in developing sense of responsibility and belongingness among employees. Five, it improves working conditions in the workplace for employees. Six, maintain and retain the existing workforce. Seven, reduce rate of absenteeism from work and labor turn over from job. Next, it improves productivity and efficiency of 
employees at workplace. So these were some of the objectives that we tried to synthesize from different studies that we have gone through, especially with respect to the labor welfare. The classification of labor welfare again was done on based on, on, on the basis of dividing industrial welfare measures into statutory, into voluntary and mutual. Statutory is the product of coercive power of the government. Statutory st stipulations compel employers to implement welfare schemes. Voluntary welfare includes all those activities which employers undertake for their workers on a voluntary basis. Mutual welfare is undertaken by the workers themselves. So some trade unions also undertake the responsibility of workers welfare. So what we understand with respect to the first lecture is that we have a certain labor welfare requirements and we tend to understand the objectives why we needed that and we tend to synthesize that. In the second lecture, we try to understand the intramural labor welfare services. What are intramural welfare? All the facilities which are provided inside the company's boundary, they are known as intramural facilities. This includes all the activities relating to industrial fatigue, providing safety measures to staffs like sufficient lighting conditions, you know, uh, it could include first aid services, good layout of the plan, machinery, etc. So all those aspects specific were discussed. Intramural services, as I, as I already mentioned, canteens, restrooms, crash, uniform, drinking water, you know, washing and bathing facilities, provision of safety measures like, uh, like fencing, like covering of machines, the uh, proper layout, good layout of the machinery and plant, fire extinguishers, all these are intramural services. In lecture 3, we looked into the extramural labor welfare services. Extramural means trade unions in HRM also which undertakes tasks that are required for welfare of their members. So these functions including, include uh, you know, providing education, recreation, the housing facilities. The unions raise funds through subscriptions from members and you know, spend them for the welfare of workers. So in case of let's say untimely death, unions provide financial help to deceased family members. Extramural functions are essential as they inculcate the spirit of cooperation among members. Extramural refers to the welfare schemes outside the factory premises. So whatever we see, maybe in terms of, let's say, housing, in terms of education, in terms of child welfare, in terms of leave travel facilities, in terms of interest-free loans, in terms of workers' cooperative stores or vocational guidance, all these are extramural labor welfare. In the fourth lecture, we looked into social security. Social security is one of the most important phenomena that considered an indispensable element of national development program. We delved into the history of social security in India. We, we went through the history in greater detail. We looked into some of the most important social security measures in India, if you recollect. The 1923 Workmen's Insurance Act, Workmen's Compensation Act, Workmen's State Insurance Act, 1948. The Maternity Benefits Act 1961, the Workers' Provident Fund Act 1952, the Gratuity Compensation Act 72, 1972. So all these acts were typically covered in the social security measures, evolution and, and actually the development of social security within our country. In last lecture, we typically went little bit out of the box. We looked into social security, especially conventions related to ILO. So the social security, the minimum standards, basically, uh, when it comes to the convention 1952, number 102 of the ILO, which was adopted by the International Labor Conference on 28 June 1952. So we looked into different, uh, you know, worldwide agreed minimum standards for all the nine branches. The branches, if you remember, the medical care, sickness benefit, unemployment benefit, old age benefit, employment injury benefit, family benefit, maternity benefit, invalidity benefit, survivors benefit. So all these typical benefits were, were considered, discussed in detail when it came to the social security in the last lecture in the module 4. In module 5, we looked into the second part of the labor welfare. We in the first lecture, we looked into the social security legislation, specifically looking into the evolution and growth. We looked into the 1923 Workmen's Insurance Act, if you recollect, the Workers' State Insurance Act, the Work Maternity Benefits Act, Worker you know, Provident Fund Act, 
the Gratuity Compensation Act of 1972, the even the Maternity Benefit Amendment Act 2017. So all these were touched upon, especially the evolution of these acts were act critically examined in the first lecture. In lecture 2 and lecture 3, typically we looked into National Policy for Older Persons, NPOP 1999. If we look into the primary objectives of NPOP, Please recollect to encourage individuals to make provision for their and their spouses old age to encourage you know families to take care of older family members to support voluntary and non-government organizations to supplement the care provided by families to provide care and protection and healthcare facilities to the to the vulnerable elderly and to promote research and training facilities for the geriatric care and even to help the elderly to lead productive and independent lives and to create awareness among the elderly. We also, if you recollect, we also looked into uh, the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment in uh, the Lecture 2 and Lecture 3 of the 5th module. We also tried to analyze the Integrated Program for Older Persons, IPOP. So if you recollect, I have made a statement. Under IPOP, 90% of the project cost is provided to NGOs for building and maintaining old age homes, daycare centers and mobile Medicare units. Please remember this IPOP underwent a revision in 2008 after which several innovative projects for the elderly have been added. So this include uh, the daycare centers for Alzheimer's, the dementia patients, physiotherapy clinics, helplines, counseling centers, awareness programs for elderly and caregivers. You know, there are sensitization programs for children in schools and colleges, formation of senior citizens association, etc. So all the financial support for capacity building in government and non-government organization is also provided. We also looked into, if you remember, NICE. National Initiative on Care for Elderly. NICE was launched in 2000 by the National Institute of Social Defense uh, under MOSJE, which conducts various courses to prepare skilled and committed professionals to provide services to the elderly. We also discussed about the NPHC National Program for Healthcare for the Elderly. We also looked into the Maintenance and Welfare of Parents and Senior Citizens Act. Please remember Old Age Protection Act, the Pradhan Mantri, Shram Yogi, Mandhan Yojana, PMSYM. That was also critically analyzed. We looked into the National Social Ac Assistance Program, NSAP. Then we ventured into some of the uh, critical social security programs. We looked into MG Narega. We looked into the Prime Minister Employment Generation Program, PMEGP, or the Prime Minister Street Vendors, Atmanirbhar Nidhi. So with respect to that, we also ventured into the Deen Dayal Upadhyay Grameen Kaushal Yojana, DDU GKY, the Deen Dayal Upadhyay Antyodhya Yojana, Day Scheme, Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana and not to forget the, the Payment of Gratuity Act, the one of the most critical uh, you know, social net act that was also discussed. In the fourth lecture typically we looked into the issues in labor welfare and social security review of welfare amenities. We understood the applicability of it. We uh, understood the issues when it came to the labor welfare. It could be anything with respect to the poor fund utilization and management. We, uh, you know, try to give you some statistics associated with that, if you recollect. Lack of adequate budgetary allocation was, uh, you know, stated as one of the critical issue. Corruption and leakage was again uh, still a prominent issue. Inadequate coverage and benefits was yet another issue. Budgetary cuts and to a certain extent, the technology and digital divide the country is facing even today, even after the developments uh, typically we had from 2014, which is almost watershed, which is appreciated to a large extent, but still we have the technology and digital divide. Then we have the review of, uh, you know, welfare amenities specifically. We looked into some of the Typical uh, yojanas, Pradhan Mantri Kisan Samman Nidhi Yojana, the PM Kisan uh, Yojana, the Soil Health Card Scheme, the Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana, PMFBY, the National Agriculture Market, ENAM, if you recollect, which was launched in 2016, was a transformative initiative aimed at establishing a unified national electronic trading platform for agriculture commodities. So, 
Uh, we looked into that, the primary goal of that being to integrate agriculture markets across the country. We looked into the Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sinchai Yojana, a significant initiative launched in India in 2015. Uh, the, the particular Yojana aims to enhance water use efficiency and extend irrigation coverage with the agriculture sector. We also looked into the PKVY, Paramparagat Krishi Vikas Yojana, the National Food Security Mission, which was one of the, the best or the top rated uh, missions of the government. We also tried to understand some of the challenges in the implementation of this, this particular welfare amenities, like uh, challenges like targeting and inclusivity, challenges like implementation of bottlenecks, challenges like implementation bottlenecks, limited coverage, insufficient coverage of risks, certain price distortions that were happening, lack of extension services that were prevalent. So these were discussed extensively in the fourth lecture of module 5. In M5, L5, the fifth lecture of module 5, we looked into the role of welfare officer specifically and problems in enforcement of welfare amenities. We looked into the role of welfare officers typically executing policies regarding working conditions, welfare etc. of workers in industrial undertakings, maintaining liaison between management and labor and promoting harmonious relation between them. These were some of the critical functions. If you recollect the problems which we discussed, problems in the enforcement of the welfare amenities, please note we looked into the complex procedures, the bureaucratic inefficiencies still lingering around, poor coordination that was there, inadequate resources happen to be one of the biggest problems like the funding constraints, you know, human resource constraints, the corruption and mismanagement, you know, embezzlement, fraud being one of them, nepotism and favoritism being another. Lack of awareness and access was also discussed as one of the critical issue like the information gap you have, the geographical barriers that are there. Political interference was also a critical reason, policy instability, politicization, you know, culture and social barriers, stigma and discrimination, cultural resistance. Monitoring and accountability issues like lack of transparency, inadequate oversight, economic factors, economic instability, all these factors were also critical. So need for an integrated social security was developed. We looked into a comprehensive coverage, we looked into efficiency, we looked into equity, we looked into enhanced data management, economic stability, improved policy making, etc. So these were some of the critical aspects which we discussed in module 5. In module 6, we ventured into the Employees Typical Compensation Act, Occupational Diseases Compensation, etc. We looked into these fundamental factors like the Employees Compensation Act, Employer Obligation, Occupational Disease, etc. We tried to give the objectives and we tried to, if you remember, the starting was by defining the key terms. Who is a dependent? Who is a dependent? What do you mean by disablement? So this was the initial understanding or this was the first point of discussion we had, if you remember. So as per the Employees Compensation Act, a dependent refers to a specific family member like a spouse, children or parents who are entitled to receive compensation if the employee dies from a work-related accident. And disablement, Ladies and gentlemen, is the act, as per the act, it defines disablement as a complete or partial loss of an employee's capacity to work. The severity of this impairment determines the amount of compensation awarded. So please understand that when you are looking into employee's compensation, especially it looked into the legal implications of the act. We had a, a critical discussion on the legal implications, typically for employers and employees. If you remember, for employees, compensation liability was one of the legal implication. Duty to provide a safe workplace was an implication. Strict liability was an implication. Whereas, when you look into the, uh, the legal implication for employees, claiming compensation was one and maintaining records was another. So please note, these were some of the initial uh, discussions we had in the first lecture of the module six. In the second lecture, typically we looked into the right to compensation in the presence of Employees State Insurance Act. Please note the core benefits which we discussed with respect to ESI Act, one of the one of the most famous act, if I can use the term, when we discuss labor welfare. Anybody who has 
you know, uh, remotely associated with labor welfare and industrial relations will be in a position to identify what do you mean by ESI. So the core benefits of the ESI Act the, was that the comprehensive medical care was taken care of, financial security during challenges emerged as one of the significant aspect and most importantly guaranteed compensation was something that was vital. So we looked into who is eligible for the coverage under the ESI Act typically. We looked into the types of compensation that will come under the ESI Act like the sickness benefit, the maternity benefit, temporary disablement benefit, the permanent disablement benefit, the dependent benefit, etc. So these were some of the factors which we looked in the second lecture. In the third lecture, typically we looked into the evolution of the Provident Fund legislation in India. The central government health scheme also was discussed. So EPF. When you looked into that particularly, what was the objective? Uh, even when we looked into the central government health scheme, what was the central objective? Typically, if you look into the, the critical objectives that were discussed like reducing financial burden, promote, uh, promoting you know, preventive care, you know, improving the health outcomes, these were some of the critical uh, benefits or, which we, or objectives which we tend to discuss. Then we also looked into the coverage, who can actually avail the benefits. Then in the fourth lecture of the sixth module, we looked into the Employees Provident Fund Miscellaneous and Provisions Act 1952. We looked into the scope, we looked into the definitions like uh, what were the two key social security schemes, the EPF scheme, Employee Provident Fund scheme, the Employees Pension scheme, which was introduced in 1995. So these were typically discussed. We also looked into some of the amendments and expansion with respect to this, the employees pension scheme specifically, what is EPS, what is the eligibility for this EPS, what do you typically get out of or what is the benefit of EPS etc. When you looked into or when you recollect the fifth lecture of the sixth module, we looked into again employees provident fund, deposit linked insurance scheme. So what was this deposit link insurance scheme all about? What is the significance of EPF and typically the deposit linked insurance scheme? It promotes a culture of saving, no doubt about it. It gives you a social security, a safety net as I always mentioned, a financial stability, a historical and ongoing benefit that you will definitely accrue. We also looked into the benefits for employees like the retirement savings, the entire savings that they have that worked Sometimes, you know, intentionally it might not be possible for them to save that, but now they are getting it. Life insurance cover, the tax benefits ideally what they are getting also were discussed typically. We looked into the Employees Provident Fund also. We looked into the key features of this EPF scheme. Specifically, if you recollect the mandatory coverage, the joint contribution, again, the tax benefits associated with that and the government management. So these were some of the typical aspects what we discussed in module 6. In module 7, we looked into the fourth part of the labor welfare. Typically, we looked into, we started with the discussion on employees pension scheme specifically. We looked into various aspects of employees pension scheme, different types of pension. We looked into the eligibility criteria, what should be the eligibility criteria. We looked into details, I'm not wasting uh, the time here. In the second lecture, we looked into the payment of Gratuity Act 1972 enactment scope and coverage specifically so what was the applicability it extends to whole of india this was something which was very critical when it came to uh, gratuity and we also looked into the objectives of the particular act the salient features of the payment of gratuity act specifically when you look into the third lecture again main provisions we try to understand the concept of penalties under the payment of gratuity act typically we again try to develop the background, we try to understand the, the compulsory insurance concept, we also try to introduce some of the key notes especially with respect to the, the concept of penalties and the payment of gratuity related to that. Fourth and fifth lecture, we combined it together, we typically looked into the Maternity Benefit Act 1961 in detail. Please note, Maternity Benefit Act 1961 as I already mentioned is a legislation that protects the employment of women at the time of a maternity. So it entitles women employees of maternity benefit which is fully paid wages during the absence from work and to take care of her child. So the act is applicable to the establishments of employing uh, you know 10 or more employees 
And if you look into the recent updates, the Maternity Benefit Act 1961 has been amended through the Maternity Amendment Bill 2017, which was passed in Lok Sabha on, on, I think, 2017 March. So this is something which we have seen with respect to the Maternity Benefit Act. We have seen the benefits of Maternity Benefit Act, some of the features and salient features and uh, typically the main highlights with respect to the particular act, which was one of the defining act when it came to labor welfare and industrial relations. In the eighth module, we ventured into Child Labor Prohibition and Regulation Act 1986. The objectives were critical objectives were clear. We discussed on the concerns and issues regarding child labor. Uh, in the first uh, lecture, we tried to look into the objectives specifically. Uh, we also looked into some of the uh, concerns like exploitation, education, health and safety, the poverty, the human rights violations angle, the bonded labor angle, social stigma. You know, we looked into the global supply chain, how it gets affected. We looked into legislation and enforcement. We also looked into rehabilitation and social support vis-a-vis -vis the concerns and issues regarding child labor in India. We also looked into the Guru Swami committee and what were the outcomes of that committee report and how the Child Labor Prohibition and Regulation Act 1986 emerged. We looked into the objectives specifically, the, the various uh, pertinent issues of the child labor was discussed in the first lecture. In lecture 2 and lecture 3, we looked into the prohibition of employment and regulation of conditions of children in certain occupations and other provisions. Penalties and procedures were looked into. But we tried to establish certain key aspects like what do you mean by occupation? What are the different jobs in which the children cannot be employed? So the occupation, the process, penalties. Penalties, especially if you recollect, it was covered under section 14. So all these as aspects were typically covered. When you look into the fourth lecture, we looked into the central board of workers education scheme. We looked into the rationale. We looked into the schemes and the composition of boards specifically. We tend to understand, please note, uh, the Central Board of Workers Education Scheme is a government body dedicated to the holistic development and education of the workforce. So it was established with the goal of enhancing the skills, knowledge and well-being of workers across various industries. The scheme focuses on empowering individuals with the tools needed for the professional growth and personal enrichment. So in 2014, the CBWE, Central Board of Workers Education, was renamed as the Topan Tengari National Board for Workers Education and Development, DTNBWED. Repeat that the Topan Tengari National Board for Workers Education and Development. We looked into the vision and mission of the particular board. We looked into the objective of the board, why the board was established, why, what was the need for the uh, board in itself. Then we, we concluded the module with five-year plans and workers' education. Typically, we looked into certain key parameters uh, and how the new Niti Aayog has emerged and what is Niti Aayog doing vis-a-vis -vis the workers' education. So we looked into certain, certain uh, divisional plays and uh, you know, functions with respect to Niti Aayog. In the ninth module, we looked into one of the most critical acts, the Factories Act. We started with the Factories Act, we started with some simple definitions, the authorities with respect to act, the objectives of the act, the objectives like welfare, like health, like safety, like working hours, like minimum wage, like penalties. So all these objectives were considered in detail. Administrative measures of the Factories Act of 1948. You know, the Factories Act of 1948 mandates the formation of a child labor committee in each factory. That was considered. A conciliation officer designated by the government can settle a labor dispute between an employer and a worker. So this officer's authority is to conciliate, not to mediate. We also looked into the health safety provisions relating to hazardous process, M9L2, where we looked into some of the health related provisions. We looked into different sections, cleanliness, disposals of waste and effluents, ventilation and temperature, dust and fume artificial humidation, overcrowding, lighting, drinking water, latrin and urinal, spittoon. So we have, we have gone section by section, I think from section 11 
to section 20. So, if you recollect, you can get all the details in the second lecture. In the third lecture, we looked into the welfare working hours for adults, specifically with respect to the act. We looked into significant amendments also. And we looked into significant welfare measures also with respect to the amendments. So, all uh, different facilities like the facilities for sitting, first aid, you know, appliance, canteens, shelters, restrooms, lunch rooms, right, crush, welfare officers, all these aspects, even including working hours provisions under the Factories Act. What, what is a working hour weekly? What is a working hour with respect to a working pattern with respect to weekly holidays, compensatory holidays, daily hours, you know, rest intervals, spread over, night shifts, double employment, notice of periods of work for adults. All these aspects were critically uh, understood. When we ventured into the lecture 4 and lecture 5, employment of young persons annual leave with wages and penalties and procedures other provisions we try to understand employment of young persons application of chapter we looked into the employment of young persons specifically we looked also into the penalties and procedures penalties and procedures with respect to uh, the the provisions of the factories act so these were most of the significant discussions especially if you if you remember we looked both into the general penalty for offences and we also looked into the liability of owner of premises in certain circumstances like where in any premises if you recollect separate buildings are leased to different occupiers. For use as separate factories the owner of premises shall be responsible for provision and maintenance of common facility. We also looked into many other prov provisions with respect to safe means of access with respect to fencing of machinery, with respect to precautions in case of fire, with respect to maintenance of hoists and lifts, with respect to maintenance of any other common uh, facilities provided in the premises, etc. So, this was what module 9 was all about. Then we ventured into module 10. From module 10, it was more of looking into the future of labor welfare. Specifically, uh, we started with payment of wages in the first lecture. We looked into the objectives and scope of the particular act, Payment of Wages Act, historical perspectives of payment of wages, the amendments, etc. Then we tried to understand the objectives of the Payment of Wages Act. Then we tried to look into uh, some of the objectives which were very critical, like consistent and timely wage payment, regulation of wage payment procedures, prohibition of unauthorized deductions, prevention of wage abuse, dispute resolution. So, all these critical provisions or objectives certainly were discussed in greater detail. In the second lecture, typically we looked into the wage legalities and authorized deductions miscellaneous provisions. We looked into what are the miscellaneous provisions with respect to the act, especially section 7. When we looked into miscellaneous provisions, I think we got the understanding of clear and detailed wage settlements, prohibition of delay in wage payment, protection against unlawful deductions. You know, we had a discussion on redressal of grievances. We had a discussion on penalties for non-compliance, application of the act to contract and peace rate workers, and even to a certain extent provision for inspections and non-discrimination in wage payment. In the third lecture, we looked into the Wages Act 1948 scope and fixation of Minimum Wages Act specifically or Minimum Wages specifically. We looked into the key provisions. We also, interestingly, if you recollect, we looked into the impact and implementation. What are the different social welfare and economic stability concepts like poverty alleviation, stimulating the, the spending part, consumer spending. Uh, even to a certain extent the socio-economic equality. We also try to comprehend the challenges and opportunities like informal sector integration, compliance and awareness, economic competitiveness, etc. Then we also try to understand the, the procedures for fixing minimum wages mode of payment miscellaneous provision in lecture 4. We try to understand the process with respect to the fixation of minimum wages. In lecture 5, typically, we looked into the equal remuneration with respect to scope, definitions and provisions. 
we looked into the entire uh, you know uh, scope that is guided beyond like local authorities hospitals nursing homes who will come under this banks ins insurance companies other financial institutions educational teaching training research institutions mines etc so all these aspects were discussed in the in the last lecture of module 10 then we ventured into something which is more critical and more futuristic workers participation the first lecture we looked into a detailed understanding of what is the concept of participation what do you mean by the scope and importance of participation what are the different challenges we defined what is workers participation management please note please recollect for management it's a joint consultation prior to decision so making for workers it means co-determination while for government it's an association of labors with management without the final authority or a responsibility in the decision making we looked into the objectives closely objectives like increasing productivity of labor by improving cooperation between employer and employees purpose of participation was to ensure human dignity participation management seeks to bring a change in attitude of workers participation provides employees with an opportunity to express themselves and a sense of belonging pride and to a certain extent accomplishment we also looked into you know the degree and forms of labor participation in the second lecture typically we looked into the different forms of labor participation if you recollect you have seen certain forms like work council like employee ownership something like job enrichment even to a certain extent collective bargaining joint management council jmcs we had a, a detailed discussion on jmcs joint management councils board levels board level councils we also looked into works committee joint management councils again in lecture 3 in greater detail what we tried was that we defined uh, these committees and specifically when we went in greater detail about joint management council we looked into the functions of works committee we looked into the functions of joint management councils in the in the third lecture typically of the 11th module in the fourth lecture we looked into the scheme of employees participation in in psus participation in in private sector typically we tried to give the definition of employee participation in psus we tried to look into the salient features salient features like involvement in decision making democratic workplace you know various forms and structures of the participation what are the benefits what are the challenges associated with the workers benefits all these aspects were were actually critically discussed we also looked into finally the participation of workers in management bill 1990 we we tend to discuss the the growth and why it it got stuck as a bill and we also looked into the importance the key aspects please recollect the key aspects it provided a legal framework it proposed various schemes and methods it's, it defined the term worker to include all types of employees both managerial as well as non managerial that was the key aspect uh, when we look into this particular bill it provided for setting up of shop floors and establishment councils determining the mode of representation of worker representatives it assigned specific functions it it provided for secret ballot empowering the appropriate government also was one of the strict provisions of the act or for the bill having provisions for punishment also was certainly included so these were some of the typical aspects when we considered module 11 and finally in our detailed discussion module 12 we tend to introduce all the updates updates in the term of in the spirit of labor codes what do you mean by labor codes what are the labor reforms undertaken we looked into the labor law since 2014 what has changed how transparency and accountability has come into the picture how labor laws framework in india is undergoing a drastic change what are the labor reforms background we looked typically into the code on wages we looked into the industrial relations code we looked into the social security code we looked into the occupational safety health and working conditions code so these were introduced in the first lecture of module 12 in the second lecture of module 12 we looked into the code on wages specifically the wage bill which was passed by parliament in 2019 it seeks to regulate the wage and bonus payment in all employments where any industry business trade or manufacture is carried out this code 
actually subsume the following laws. If you, if you recollect the Minimum Wages Act, the Payment of Ages Act, Payment of Bonus Act, even Equal Remuneration Act of 1976. The code extends to all establishments where any trade, industry or manufacturing process is carried on to all types of employees irrespective of their wage limit, skilled, semi-skilled, unskilled, supervisory, managerial across all sectors, to all types of employers who engage employees for their trade, industry or manufacturing activities. Now, when you look into the third important aspect of module 12, we looked into the Occupational Safety, Health and Working Conditions Code 2020. We defined what do you mean by these terms, what is occupational safety, what is the relevance of this particular code and what are the other provisions like benefits for interstate migrant workers. Please recollect, we have talked about the displacement elements. We have talked about the database for interstate migrant workers. I'm not going to detail on this because we have completed it recently. Social security fund, we talked about that in greater extent. In, in the fourth lecture of module 12, we looked into industrial relations code 2020. Industrial relations code provides a broader framework to protect the, the particular rights of workers to make unions, to reduce the friction between the employers and workers and to provide regulations for settlement of industrial disputes. We, we tracked the timeline of the passage of this particular uh, code, industrial relations code. We also looked into the different acts that uh, is consolidated under this industrial relations code, namely the Trade Union Act of 1926, the Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act 1946 and the Industrial Disputes Act of 1947. We looked into the scope and applicability of this industrial relations code. If you, if you recollect, you'll see that we talked about the registration, cancellation and alteration of the name of trade union. We looked into the constitution of work committee and grievance redressal committee. We looked into the incorporation of a registered trade union, recognition of a negotiating union, preparation of standing order, registration of standing order, you know, constitution of industrial tribunals, illegal strikes, and to a certain extent, closure of an industrial establishment. We looked into the key provisions of the standing order typically. And finally, in the last lecture, we looked into the code on social security 2020. We looked into the code. Please note, the code undertakes integrating most of the labor laws. I think nine labor laws which we have discussed relating to social security, which includes the Employees' Compensation Act 1923 one. Second, the Employees' State Insurance Act 1948. Third, the Employees' Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1952. Fourth, the Employees' Exchange Compulsory Notification of Vacancies Act 1959. Fifth, the Maternity Benefit Act 1961. Sixth, the Payment of Gratuity Act 1972. Seventh, the Cine Workers' Welfare Fund Act 1981. Eighth, the Building and Other Construction Workers Cess Act 1996 and finally the ninth Act, the Unorganized Workers Social Security Act 2008. We, we detail on the coverage and applicability of this Act. We looked into certain critical aspects like, you know, how the functions are being facilitated by digitization, social security fund, career center under the code on social security. So this is what we have seen across the 12 modules in different lectures. I have given a detailed recap of what it was, more than a recap, as I've already mentioned. I've tried to synthesize the, the understanding, you know, rather than by hearting it up, but rather than mugging it up, I would always advise you that synthesize your learning. You can see that every single module has certain key takeaways. Every single lecture I have designed in such a way that it has a key takeaway. So please note, this is the synthesis of the entire 12 modules. I hope you had a wonderful learning experience over this entire 12 modules going through right from understanding what do you mean by labor welfare, what do you mean by industrial relations, till what we have today as the labor courts. So I, I think you had a uh, you know, wonderful uh, learning experience and I hope to see you in some other class soon. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.